Thank you uh, very much, Graham. Big thank you to you, Scott, for your uh, words of welcome and setting the scene uh, here this evening so expertly. Uh, we're also really grateful to the engine shed for letting us use this fantastic building, and it is a fantastic building. It's my first time here, and I'm thoroughly impressed with everything that I've seen so far. Uh, but my biggest thanks this evening go to all of you uh, for coming here to take part in this discussion with us this evening. It's great to see so many people here gathered together to talk about politics uh, on a Wednesday evening. And as Graham said, the main purpose of this event is for us to hear from you. So I'll be uh, relatively brief in my opening remarks this evening. Uh, this is the 50th occasion since 2008 uh, in which the cabinet has got itself out of Edinburgh and has met in locations uh, literally the length and breadth of the country from Shetland to the borders uh, and almost everywhere now I think in between and it's fantastic for us because we get to hear views and uh, listen to perspectives from people in different communities, communities of different shapes and sizes facing different challenges and opportunities. So it is an invaluable way of making sure that we are alive to the issues that are being faced in every part of the country. Uh, as Graham said, we had a formal cabinet meeting uh, this afternoon at the offices of Zero Waste Scotland. So we've been doing the uh, the business of government today but when we take the cabinet on tour uh, for want of a better expression the highlight and the central part really is the public event like this one and it is your opportunity to ask us whatever you want uh, and I, I want to stress that because often at these events people are quite surprised that we don't vet the questions in advance Sometimes we wish that we were able to vet the questions in advance, but we don't do that. You literally can ask us anything that you want, whether it's a, about a local matter, a national matter, or a matter of global uh, politics and interest. And we will do our best here to answer your questions uh, as frankly and directly as we can. Uh, we'll be honest with you if you're asking us something on a point of detail that we don't have at our fingertips and if that's the case we will undertake to get back to you and if there's something you're desperate to ask but you don't particularly want to ask it in front of everybody else I think you've been given uh, forms where you can submit a question and we will reply in writing so uh, I really want to labour that point this is your opportunity to put us in the spot to tell us what you think we're getting wrong to tell us what you think we need to do better or just to share your views about what's happening in the uh, crazy world that we live in right now uh, what I want to talk to you about this evening because it has been the main focus of the cabinet's deliberations this afternoon is climate change Rosanna Cunningham uh, led a discussion at Cabinet about what we need to do to raise our game uh, so that we can play our full part in the global challenge uh, to address climate change. But before I go into that in detail, I think it's important to stress that our work in climate change it doesn't take place in isolation. It is a fundamental part and, I have to say, an increasingly important part of the day-to-day -day business of government. So alongside the efforts we are making on climate change, we are, of course, continuing as a government to do everything we can to avoid a no-deal Brexit at the end of October. In fact, our preference would be to avoid Brexit altogether of any uh, shape or form. Uh, we're also working hard to make sure that the future of Scotland can be decided by the people of Scotland uh, and not imposed on us uh, by others. Uh, we also continue to take steps to support business growth. We've had uh, figures published today that shows that despite Brexit, our economy is growing and growing slightly faster uh, than the rest of the UK. But we need to keep supporting our businesses. Uh, we're investing in transport. We're investing in the broadband links that, of course, all parts of Scotland in the uh, modern age we live in need to thrive. And alongside all of those efforts to make Scotland a more prosperous country, uh, we are working hard to make Scotland a fairer and more equal country as well. We're taking measures to tackle poverty, in particular 
child poverty and investing in our health service, in expanding childcare and in education. Um, I see some young people in the audience uh, this evening. I'm, I'm not sure if there are any here or indeed parents of young people who got exam results yesterday. If you got your exam results and they were uh, what you were hoping for, congratulations. Uh, many of our young people day in and day out demonstrate all that is fantastic about Scotland and give us the optimism uh, about the future of our country. Uh, so all of that uh, work continues on a day-to-day -day basis and no doubt you want to ask us questions across the range of those topics and many more beside. Uh, but as I said the main focus uh, tonight of my remarks is climate change and I think it's right that we do uh, not just as a government but as a country as a society take the time to talk more both about the challenge uh, but also about the solutions and the opportunities that flow from those solutions. Uh, the challenge of climate change is one that the world can't afford to ignore or be complacent about any longer. We owe it to the next generation to change our behaviour now so that we leave the planet in a better state for those who come after us. And I think it's important, and I think people are becoming increasingly aware of this, that climate change is not something that impacts on people who live hundreds of thousands of miles away. It certainly does that. But increasingly, it's something that we are feeling the impact of here in Scotland as well. I mean, just two days ago on Monday, it was confirmed that July was the hottest month ever recorded around the world. Now, I know we all enjoy the nicer weather and the summer temperatures, but we can't escape the fact that that is a cause for concern. As the world continues to heat, we know that extreme weather events are going to become much more common. Over the summer, we've seen evidence of that. Locally, there have been flash floods here in Stirling and in nearby areas. Landslips, including uh, not far from here, are having a real impact on transport and on people's lives. Bruce Crawford, the local MSP, I know has spent much of today with constituents in uh, Glengyle at Loch Catron, who are themselves dealing with the impact of a, a landslip. Uh, we've seen elsewhere in the UK the quite extraordinary scenes at the Whaley Bridge Dam in Derbyshire. And on a global scale, we've seen large-scale fires in regions like Siberia and Alaska. Uh, so climate change is not something for the future. It's not something that is always far away. It's having an impact on our lives now, and it's going to have an increasing impact in the years to come. And that means finding the solutions to it is going to also impact on all of our lives and increasingly we find it impacts on everything that the government does. It affects our environment, our infrastructure, our health and our quality of life. Um, and that's why the Scottish Government has acknowledged the climate emergency, the global climate emergency. Uh, we recognise that it is the biggest economic, social and moral issue that the world faces today. And because of that, it requires urgent action uh, commensurate with the scale of that challenge. Uh, so for us to play our part, we need to rapidly reduce and then end our contribution to climate change. Uh, we've already got a success story to be proud of. We've already halved our greenhouse gas emissions since 1990, and we've now stated that Scotland will achieve net zero emissions by 2045. Uh, if this is approved by Parliament, and I expect it will be, that means Scotland's contribution to climate change will end by 2045. Now that will be sooner than virtually any other country on the face of the planet. Uh, that said, it is still quite some time away. So we have targets that ensure that we're reducing emissions every year between now and then. Now, one thing you learn very quickly in politics and in government is that it's very easy to set targets. Uh, meeting those targets, and we may touch on this in a whole ro uh, host of areas tonight, is much harder to do. So achieving these targets is going to affect every aspect of lives. It will affect the jobs we do, how we travel, how we design our cities and towns in the future, and of course how we keep our homes and our workplaces warm. So I'm going to very briefly just touch on some of the challenges that all of that throws up, uh, but also some of the opportunities it presents by referring to the three visits that Rosanna, uh, Marie Goujon and I made earlier today and uh, Scott and Graham have already referred to some of these. Um, I had the opportunity to see the renewable heat project which has been 
run by Stirling Council and Scottish Water, uh, based by the water treatment works at Fourthside Way. And that takes the heat that is found in wastewater and distributes it to buildings like Fourth Bank Stadium and St Modens High School. And it's quite literally a way of taking something which is waste and doing something useful with it. And there's scope for that project to expand here in Stirling and to be repeated across the country. And I think it demonstrates very, very well something that is extremely important. Decarbonising our economy, for the reasons I've been talking about, is first and foremost a moral obligation. We owe it to ourselves, to other countries and to the next generation. But it also provides big opportunities for us if we get our act together and do it properly. You know, that heating project that I saw today won't just reduce emissions, although it will do that, it will also help reduce heating bills for the organisations that are taking part. So projects like that have a big uh, potential to help us tackle fuel poverty, which many people in many different communities have suffered for too long. Uh, and that's a project which has been delivered here by FES, which is a company based in Stirling. So there's local economic benefit from it as well. I know that other employers in Stirling are also involved in the low carbon sector, Superglass, which produces insulation materials uh, and which has seen big investment in the last couple of years is another good example. Uh, and when you total it all up, low carbon industries already employ somewhere in the region of 50,000 people across the country. And there is every reason to expect that that figure will grow. And there uh, is potential for it to grow almost everywhere. Uh, we in Scotland, we're really lucky because we've got big strengths in areas that range from wave and tidal power to smart grids to digital technology, all the things that are vital, not just for us, but for countries across the world to meet this challenge. Uh, and because of that, you know, many of the steps that we're already taking to promote innovation and economic growth will help us uh, tackle climate change. And conversely, uh, the action we're taking to tackle climate change will help us grow the economy as well. Uh, one of the things we are doing just now, which you might have heard of, is establishing a, a Scottish National Investment Bank to support in the future ambitious companies and, and big infrastructure projects. And support, supporting the move to a low carbon economy is going to be one of the main missions uh, of that bank. So the message here I'm, I'm really trying to convey is doing all of this is essential for the environment, but it is also good for the economy. Uh, of course, we see other benefits from reducing emissions as well, and some of those are relevant to the second visit I'll just briefly refer to. Uh, Mary Gujon visited Pendrick Woods by Bridge of Allen today. Uh, woodlands like that are a fantastic local amenity, but also because trees store carbon, they have a big part to play in helping us tackle climate change. So we're planting more trees and creating new woodlands, uh, and last year, uh, again, this is a success story for Scotland, five times more trees were planted in Scotland than in the whole of England and Wales uh, put together. Uh, we're also restoring peatlands, uh, and by doing that, we're not simply helping to meet climate change targets, we're also improving natural habitats and adding to the beauty of local landscapes. Uh, and Mary, uh, I believe, went to that visit today in one of the electric vehicles that are operated by Forestry and Land Scotland, uh, because we're also trying to promote uh, wider use of electric vehicles. Uh, and again, there are benefits there that go beyond uh, climate change. Uh, electric vehicles can help us reduce traffic pollution and improve health as well. Similar is true of public transport. Um, I know. Uh, ScotRail has uh, had some performance challenges in uh, recent times, if I can put it as mildly uh, as that. But the investment we are making there means that there are now more services that carry more people uh, on more environmentally friendly trains than was the case before. So these are positive developments. We're also encouraging walking and cycling. Um, the Stirling Manager City Deal, I think, was mentioned by Scott in his introduction. Uh, as part of that, the Scottish Government is committing £7 million to new or improved active travel routes. Again, that helps us with the climate change challenge, but it also improves our cities and our towns, and it helps people to live more active uh, lives. Uh, one of the reasons I'm taking just a bit of time to stress these potential benefits is that I'm very well aware of the fact that sometimes these big changes that we all know are essential for the good of the world and for the good of the country 
sometimes don't feel as if they're good for individuals, that they're not necessarily improving our lives. In fact, they might be making our lives harder. Uh, and there is no doubt that while I don't think that's always true, in some respects, there will be challenges. Uh, responding to uh, the climate emergency will mean there are difficult decisions and important changes. Uh, so we need to make sure that we are involving people uh, so that collectively we're deciding best how to do that, which is relevant to the final visit I want to mention, which is the one Rosanna took part in at uh, Raploch today. She met with individuals and local organisations to discuss this uh, as part of the bigger national consultation that we're calling the Big Climate Conversation. And that is looking to get people's ideas and involve as many people as possible in the discussion about how we face up to and address this challenge and seize all the opportunities. Um, I, I grew up in Ayrshire in, I know you, this is going to astonish you that it's that long ago, but I grew up in Ayrshire in the uh, 1970s and, and 80s. And I remember, as many of you will, uh, the impact of uh, de-industrialisation, the loss of heavy industry and how it felt as if that big transformation in the economy was leaving too many people behind. There were uh, so many more losers out of that than there were winners in the community I grew up in. You can still see the legacy of that and that makes me really determined that as we go through this next big transformation to a, a carbon zero economy and that's what it is, it's a big transformation, we've got to do it differently. We've got to do it in a way that delivers the opportunities and not just the challenges. So the big climate conversation is a part of bringing people along in that journey. And in some ways that is the perfect place to end here because that's really the same as uh, this session is all about as well. It's about allowing people to make your voices heard, uh, to put your government on the spot uh, and to make sure uh, that what we do as a government is informed by the things that you tell us are important. So with that, I think it's a neat place for me to end and hand over to all of you. Um, I say this at every, too much to the amusement of my colleagues, I say this at every session, but the way this works is quite simple. Um, I answer all the easy questions and I hand over to all of them for the difficult questions. So I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Uh, before we move to the questions, I would be best to introduce uh, the, my colleagues on the platform. Uh, immediately to my left, we have Fiona Hislop, the Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Tourism and External Affairs. Uh, next to Fiona is John Swinney, who's the Deputy First Minister, as well as the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills. To the other side of the First Minister is Rosanna Cunningham, uh, who, as you now know, is the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform. And then we have Derek Mackay, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Economy and Fair Work. In the back row, immediately behind me, we have Shirley Ann Somerville, who's the Cabinet Secretary for Social Security and Older People, Ash Denham, who's the Minister for Community Safety, uh, Aileen Campbell, the Cabinet Secretary for Communities and Local Government, Michael Matheson, the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity. Hope you can remember all this. Uh, Jean Freeman, next to her, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport. And last but not least, Mary Goujon, the Minister for Rural Affairs and the Natural Environment. We're going to take questions in batches of three. I may also look to include some questions we've received by social media. Um, we normally, we very often, have more questions than time allows. So if you don't get the chance to ask your question, you can email your question to an email address that's going to be provided on the screens and you will get a detailed response. And beyond that, we will have some staff about at the end and you can approach them. They'll take details of your question and, as I say, you will get a detailed response. Uh, can I ask you, just before we start, the way we'll do this, if you raise your hand, and I'll try to get to you. If you wait till the microphone reaches you, if you could give your name before speaking, if you could keep your question short, and here's the difficult bit, and if the cabinet could keep their answers equally short. So, who would like to go first? Gentleman there in the blue shirt. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Cameron Archibald, and I'm a co-founder of an economic think tank called MMT Scotland. Uh, we're a think tank that focuses on climate change and economics, and just want to say, first of all, First Minister, thank you for the introduction on climate change, because as a climate activist, that's really refreshing, and it gives us a lot of relief, uh, the fact that the Scottish Government are tackling these issues. 
One of our colleagues in America, Stephanie Kelton, who's economic advisor to Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, working with her, she's pushed a policy for the Green New Deal uh, in America, the Job Guarantee Scheme, which isn't just about creating jobs for the sake of jobs, it's about social well-being for people and also green jobs. In your vision for a Scottish Green New Deal, do you see a job guarantee scheme being part of that? Okay, uh, two other questions. The lady here. Um, I'm Hannah Graham. I'm a criminologist and academic at Stirling University. And uh, my question is um, a local and a national issue in that we've got some local prisons. Uh, we've got prisons across the country that are full and overcrowded um, through care support services that are suspended. And, and despite the staff's best uh, efforts, quite a few issues happening behind bars. Um, so given that by your own estimates, the presumption against short prison sentences under 12 months is not going to do, uh, it will have a modest impact on prison numbers. And Scotland has very high prisoner numbers, uh, pr uh, imprisonment rate compared to the rest of Europe, what will the Scottish Government do to reduce um, our spiralling numbers in prison? Okay, well, those were two excellent questions to start. Can we have a third one, please? Can I get the gentleman there in the green shirt in the second row, please? Uh, hi, my name's Joe Schofield, and I work also at Stirling University in a drugs research unit that is exclusively funded by government, Scottish government, for which I'm grateful. My question is, I know that Joe Fitzpatrick can't be here tonight, but I'm concerned about the increasing drug-related deaths that are particularly affecting Scottish communities. I wondered if anyone present can talk to some of the challenges and plans there, please. Okay, thank you. First Minister. Okay, um, three big and very important issues to get us underway tonight, so thank you uh, for that. Um, Cameron, I'm going to ask Rosanna to talk more generally about uh, climate change and Green New Deal. Um, in terms of your specific question about jobs guarantee, we're, we're currently working through um, our programme for government, which we'll set out in September, uh, where climate change uh, and uh, issues like that are absolutely at the heart of what we're doing. So things like this will be you know, fleshed out a little bit more at that point. But yes is the short answer. I think we have to look at things like that uh, in order to make the transition in a just and fair way and one of the things which I think we were the first country in the world to do of course was set up a just transition commission which is all about making sure that we don't uh, leave large legacies of unemployment as we go through this transition so watch this space in terms of how some of our policies develop. Rosanna do you want to say a bit more about that? Derek yeah. you might want to say a bit more about the finance side of it. I'll go to Ash on prisons and uh, then I is it Ash or uh, Jean on drugs. I'll say a bit about that and then I'll hand over to uh, Jean on that. So, uh, Rosanna, do you want to kick off? Yeah, I, I think Derek Mackay and, and I will probably have to share um, some of this because it, it, the Green New Deal um, idea uh, ten, crosses over portfolios. And I think that's the first and most important thing that has to be said, that this isn't something, that the, the, the whole issue isn't something that can just sit neatly in one portfolio. And it's really important that we all understand that. Um, uh, there, are, there are big conversations going on right now about the role of the new investment bank, uh, about the uh, amounts of um, investment that we're making into decarbonisation, the innovation that re is required. Um, a job guarantee scheme is something I think perhaps Derek might want to, to speak about, but I don't, at the moment, I don't think we're in a place yet where we've actually agreed a job guarantee scheme, and I remain to be corrected if that's wrong. Because what we're focusing on very hard just now is what the FM talked about, which is the just transition issue. So, so in a sense, it's, it, it lies beneath that. It's a sort of implicit part of just transition that what you're trying to do is ensure that you make the, tre the transition to a decarbonised economy without leaving people behind. So I suppose in a, in a, in a sense, it's a, a, a job guarantee scheme without the capital letters at the moment because we're focusing very hard on how we make that transition and what is required in order to make that transition. Um, and that, is, that, that work is being done over the next year or two. But there are you know, uh, big issues uh, uh, with, with the transition um, and, and with how we manage that financially um, because we're gonna be coming out of industries which have been traditionally regarded as high value industries 
uh, that contribute enormously to the economy. So we've got to be thinking very carefully how, how that is managed through that process. I don't know if Derek wants to talk a little bit more about the financing of this, but our minds are very much focused on how we make sure that people are reskilled for the new industries that are going to emerge, some of which we may not even yet be aware of. And, and that's a really important thing for us to think about too. And that's exactly uh, what we're focused on, Cameron. I think we've discussed this before, haven't we? Yeah, we have. Uh, hopefully my answer this time is better than the one I gave you last time. <laughs> why you, you've asked the First Minister instead of me personally this time, but it's still come back to me. But in all seriousness, we've been investing quite a lot in innovation, in quality, in education, in attainment, because although we've got record low unemployment right now and near record high employment, um, and that's good news. Of course, the economy is transitioning right now and we're having more technological advances than I think we've ever experienced before. So we want to be ahead of the curve and that's why we're investing in digital, we're investing in innovation, more investment around research and uh, development as well, connecting academia uh, with companies and business and industry as well is very powerful and retraining people who are maybe going from industries that might not have a sustainable future to those that will whilst we're investing in that technology at the same time. In terms of the guarantee, uh, with record low unemployment, uh, which is to be welcomed, but beneath that, of course, there are issues about uh, underemployment and exploitation that we would like to do more about if we had all the powers around employment law, but with the powers and resources that we do have, we are trying to support that transition so we have a more sustainable economy as well as a more sustainable environment and focused on a race to the top for quality mm -hmm. for a country, not a race to the bottom mm -hmm. on cost. And that's the kind of economic model uh, that I know that you're particularly interested in. And a lot of work streams around the National Investment Bank, digital and business support for, for skilling and investing in skills. And as I say, it's supporting for those uh, furthest uh, from the labour market. Uh, but thanks for the opportunity to, to give a better answer than I did last time. <laughs> we, we, that's, that's for Cameron to judge rather than... <laughs> well, he, he was <laughs> nodding, he was nodding. Was it better? There you okay. go. <laughs> there you are. Good. Um, okay, we may come back to some of these issues later on. I'm just, I'm not sure the three of us have uh, done very well to start with and with short answers, Graham, so I'll, I'll move on. <laughs> Ash, do you want to take up Heather's point about prisons uh, and uh, justice reforms? Yep, absolutely. So you're quite right to say that in a European context, obviously, um, you know, Scotland does have a high prison population per head of population. So it's not obviously the case that we don't lock up enough people. Obviously, prison is the right place for serious offenders, but that sometimes prison doesn't work in the way that we'd want to in terms of rehabilitation. So the Scottish government obviously is um, undertaking a number of different approaches um, to reducing prison numbers. And obviously one of them is the presumption against short sentences. Um, and the reason that we thought that was effective is the evidence shows that people um, that are put into prison for short sentences, it's very disruptive to, to their lifestyles. So it can interrupt things like housing, it can interrupt things like employment, it can obviously cause problems with family breakdown and so on. And those are the very things that can help someone when they're released from prison in order to get back into a stable life situation and go on to be a, you know, a member of society and not get back into that cycle of crime. So that presumption um, just came into force recently, it came in on the 4th of July, and it will apply to offences that were committed after that date. So um, it's going to start um, initially having a quite a gradual impact. Um, but you're right <coughs> to say that's not going to be the whole solution to this problem, and it isn't. So some of the other things that we're doing is obviously to break that sort of cycle of reoffending and to stop people getting back into prison. Obviously that will reduce um, prison numbers over time. Reconviction rates, um, as we know, are, are down across the board, so that's a really good thing, so that will start to have an effect too. And um, the other thing that we're focusing on is obviously prevention, because if you can stop people committing crimes, obviously you're not going to need to put them into prison anyway. So we are um, treating crime specifically, and I think this is quite an innovative approach, as um, a public health approach. So investing in things like community justice, um, diversionary activities and education, 
Um, many of these programs um, were for young people specifically, um, often funded by our program Cashback for Communities. So that's where the proceeds of crime are invested back into the communities that are affected by crime. And obviously that's working through the system as well. So none of these things are going to fix the problem individually, but I think over the piece with um, a number of different um, so, um, sort of approaches to this, that cumulatively I think they will start to, to have an effect. Okay, thanks Ash. Jean, do you want to... Issue. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, Mr Schofield, you're right to be concerned about the level of drug deaths and we're very concerned about that too. Some of the things that we know is that the majority of people who have died as a result uh, of drugs are, have died as a result of polydrug use and they are in the 35 and up age group and the majority are men. Those age groups are young but many of the individuals involved have been taking drugs for a long time time and that has obviously had an impact on their health. There are a number of things we're doing, I'm sure you're very familiar with the particular uh, drug strategy that Joe Fitzpatrick uh, introduced last year, um, but what we are concerned to do is to make sure that we have a public health approach to this. That distinguishes us very sharply from the rest of the UK uh, and most recently a, a very hard criminal justice approach to drugs which I think has evidenced itself as not working. Mm -hmm. So our public health approach will look at making sure that we can wrap services around individuals. Sometimes our public services, although they are very good, are not able to work with people whose lives are chaotic mm. and who cannot uh, turn up for that two o'clock appointment. So we need to wrap those services around that. Obviously, uh, in terms of our work, we're in the lead, but my colleagues are assisting in all of that, including some of the work in prisons. And we want to make sure that we are maxing out on the powers that we have to take the most innovative but evidence-led approaches. And that evidence-led approach will be helped by the task force that Mr Fitzpatrick set up just before we broke for the summer session. And that will allow us too to continue our uh, argument, if you like, with the UK government, it is an argument because they don't agree with us, uh, for safer consumption rooms, which are proven elsewhere uh, in uh, Europe and elsewhere to be a, a helpful contributor to this. They're not the be all and end all, but they're an important contributor. If we take all of that package together, but it is evidence led and it is public health, then I think we can, over the long term, make a sustainable difference here. Okay. Um, Further questions? I'm going to move to the back because there's always a habit to focus on the front at the start of these things. There's a gentleman with his arms straight up in there uh, in the middle with a grey shirt and then the lady uh, down the front at the back with the uh, black uh, jacket. Hi, thanks very much. Uh, I too work at Stirling University. My name is Ray Ross. My wife is an English teacher and guess what, John? It's a question on education, your favourite topic. Um, Curriculum of Excellence has become embedded now and is, I think, beginning to take effect. When we look at it, and as a parent of, dare I say, eight kids, which is a lot of children and a lot of homework, one of the things I find from my wife and others is that what gets taught in the classroom is not always getting supported at home. Now, I've just wanted to highlight a scheme in Stirling, which Stirling High School has rolled out, where each kid in high school has a Chromebook, and from that Chromebook, lessons are delivered to an extent to take home and do your homework. And it is working very, very well. And kids in Stirling High School are really benefiting from it. Is there any chance that this would be, as we take away the charitable status of private schools and generate funds through that, that Chromebooks could be rolled out across schools in Scotland and a coordinated IT approach to allow what's taught in the classroom to be able to access and read at home with help of parents at various levels, taking uh, account of kids that are better placed to understand and kids with maybe learning needs, a system that could maybe work. Is this a possibility to have a look at the Stirling High School model because it seems to be well ahead of the game? Just a thought. Okay, thanks. And then the lady down the front at the back with the black jacket, providing she doesn't work for Stirling University. <laughs> Anne Knox, um, Sterling Sir Voluntary Enterprise. Uh, Sterling was a finalist in the European Volunteering, Volunteering Capital Competition. And while we narrowly missed out on the accolade, we are steadfast in our commitment to increasing volunteering. 
SVE as a third sector interface in the area is wholly supportive of volunteering for all, the national framework for volunteering. And we welcome the clear reference to removing any and all barriers to people volunteering. What can the volunteering involving organisations expect as the next steps for turning this vision into a reality? Okay, thank you. Does anybody else at the back want to ask a question? Okay, there's a gentleman in a light blue uh, shirt. So, hello, my name is Yoon. I also work at the university. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also a student at the university. My question is, um, how badly will Scotland be affected by a no-deal Brexit? What are your thoughts on Boris Johnson and his predecessor, <laughs> Theresa May? Thank you so much. First Minister. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will hand over uh, to John to answer Ray's question, uh, to Aileen uh, to answer Anne's question. Uh, I'll then uh, bring in Fiona to talk about uh, implications of a no-deal Brexit, and that will give me time to work out <laughs> how I'm going to answer the question, what do I think of Boris Johnson without <laughs> swearing at you? So, John. <laughs> Um, Ray, thank you very much for your question. And uh, I'll, the first thing I'll say to you is I'll, I'll look very carefully at the Stirling High School model. I, I spend, there isn't a week goes by other than the summer holidays when I'm not in a school. And I'll make a point of going to Stirling High School and to look at the example that you cite. Um, I think the, 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 the most important point that I take from your question is the importance of um, family and carer support for the education of young people. So whether that's Chromebooks or no Chromebooks, the thing you've got to have is education that is supported by family learning and family support. And one of the things which I think is a really interesting lesson that's now emerging from the work that we've done where we've, as a government, uh, empowered schools by sending money directly from the government to individual schools, where schools are able to decide what are their you know, what would help them to help close the attainment gap is that you've seen a range of different approaches taken forward around the country, but a big theme has been about family engagement in learning. And some of that might take the form of um, practical measures such as Chromebooks. It may also take the measure of realising that some families aren't actually able to support children because of learning weaknesses that families and parents have. And schools are now embracing that to try to assist, which is having the effect of improving the learning capabilities of parents, but it's also helping young people into the bargain. So I think the point I would stress, and which is one of the big lessons I take from the, 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 the work that we've taken forward um, on the National Improvement Framework in Education, is the importance of family engagement in the learning process of children and young people. And there will be a variety of means taken forward to support that, but whatever format they take, that is a crucial ingredient in making sure young people are well supported in taking forward their education and fu be fulfilled as a consequence. But I will look at the Stirling High School example. Thank you for that. Okay, and Aileen, do you want to address Anne's point on volunteering? Yeah, thanks uh, for raising the question. And I think uh, uh, from the outset, I think we all owe uh, volunteers, volunteers a great debt of gratitude. In my experience, certainly what I see when I go around the different parts of the country is that the volunteers enhance the communities, they provide opportunity for so many people, and also they're creating really happy memories for many young people as well. So that's why we want more people to uh, volunteer and to remove those barriers that you talked about and why we launched the volunteering framework and also the, the youth volunteering framework uh, as well. To, to and it was a collaborative effort, it was done in partnership, which I think is really important as well, because the delivery of the ambitions that are within that, those documents have to be delivered in partnership eh, as well. And I was really vexed that Stirling didn't win the, or get the accolade of becoming the eh, volunteering, European volunteering capital. Eh, but what I was heartened to see is that Stirling haven't taken the foot off the gas. They want to continue to eh, make sure that they do all they can to support the army of volunteers. I think there's a huge number of volunteers in 
in, um, in Stirling, well above the national rate. So it's clear that there's leadership here at Stirling about wanting to continue to promote opportunities through volunteering, remove those barriers, also rethink what volunteering means, because I think sometimes there's predisposed ideas about what opportunities must look like, but actually we need to think creatively how you, about, how you uh, tailor uh, volunteering opportunities to people in their busy, busy lives, their balance in work and life, and we need to be, we need to reimagine and rethink those volunteering uh, opportunities. And that's why the, the framework's really important because it's going to be delivered in partnership and it allows us, with the strong platform that we have in Scotland, to continue to encourage more people to volunteer. And I think certainly there's great leadership shown here in, in Stirling, a great army of volunteers, and it's really good that the, the council here is wanting to continue to uh, promote those opportunities. But we have to support that, and that's why the, the volunteering framework is important and why we need to encourage and continue to encourage young volunteers as well because if they get into the habit of volunteering then they'll continue through the rest of their adult life. Okay, okay, thanks Aileen. Um, Fiona, do you want to say a word or two about no deal implications and yeah, no planning? I mean, Brexit hasn't happened, three years on and it hasn't happened and a no deal Brexit, a cliff edge Brexit with no plans, no arrangements would be catastrophic and that's why it has to be stopped. Our preference is not to have Brexit at all. But in terms of you look at the economic impact, we know from Fraser Valander and other economic analysis, you're looking at 100,000 100, jobs lost. We've got low unemployment just now, but it puts us potentially, you've seen the projections, into recession. But the most immediate thing uh, will be about the immediate issues about trying to mitigate some of the issues about transportation, supply of basic goods and services. You've seen the issues around the food and drink in industry, saying about in terms of distribution, what that might mean for them then manage distribution of food and supply. It's extremely serious indeed. And that's why um, under the, the leadership of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister and Mike Russell, our uh, Brexit uh, Cabinet Secretary, we have been having to focus on something we don't want, uh, which is trying to prepare for a no-deal Brexit. We can stop and mitigate some things, but there are things that we will just not be able to do. And I think the final point probably is to Scotland is one of the, the most important thing. And that's what happens to all the EU citizens that are here. What does it say to them if the UK crashes out with any, without any arrangements, without any guarantees? And Boris Johnson is now, um, he's, he's now rolling back on commitments he said that he provide legal provision. This country needs people and we value the EU citizens that live here. We've already in the last year lost um, uh, 14,000 EU citizens compared to the previous years. We need people in all our services and it's so important that we make sure that we can have those arrangements. So yes, it will have a, a very, very serious uh, implications indeed. We will do what we can, but there is only so much that we can do. And that's why the political focus, I think the First Minister uh, will certainly hope uh, talk about is about trying to make sure, even at this very last moment, that Scotland has a choice and Scotland can try and help our colleagues in the rest of the UK also uh, to try and stop Brexit. Well, thanks, Fiona. On the question of, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to get personal about what I think about Boris or, or, or his predecessor, but there is a serious point here. Um, I, I was uh, being asked by, well, been asked by more than one journalist why I didn't smile more when I welcomed Boris Johnson to Butte House uh, <laughs> last Monday. And I mean, the honest answer is I am not thrilled to be welcoming Boris Johnson as Prime Minister uh, to Scotland, because I think the vast majority of people in Scotland, had we been given the choice, wouldn't have chosen to have Boris Johnson as Prime Minister. I, I guess and suspect there is a significant proportion of people in Scotland who are utterly horrified at the fact that Boris Johnson is Prime Minister. And, you know, when you talk to him, as I uh, did last week, there's a lot of bluff and bluster, but not a lot of detail around the assurances that he's willing to give about Brexit, and in particular, a no-deal Brexit. And my judgment is he knows fine well. He, he can't not know because he'll be getting the same advice and the same briefings as we are in the Scottish Government. He knows fine well the risks and the damage that a no-deal Brexit will do, but he's prepared to do it anyway. He's prepared to push the UK off that cliff edge at the end of October. And um, I absolutely am convinced that he is prepared to do that. I don't think, it, I don't think to that extent it is a bluff. And that makes him and the government he's leading 
in my view, really dangerous because the implications for people, the length and breadth of the UK are severe. And it won't be Boris Johnson uh, who pays that price. He might pay a price politically, but he won't pay the same kind of price ordinary people pay, nor will members of his cabinet. You know, some of them, Jacob Rees-Mogg, for example, they've already moved some of their substantial wealth to other countries to insulate themselves. I mean, how you know, shocking and shameful is that, that somebody who wants to uh, subject the rest of the country to the implications of Brexit is able to protect themselves um, in that way. So as Fiona says, we will do everything we can uh, to mitigate and protect against no deal Brexit, but we will also continue to focus as hard as we can, even at this late stage, on trying to stop Brexit for the whole of the UK. That would be a lot easier, uh, to be frank, and. Uh, I, I can't avoid being a bit political about this. That would be a lot easier, easier if Jeremy Corbyn would get off the fence on Brexit and actually join us in trying to stop it happening. Uh, but my final point is this, and Boris Johnson, I guess, brings this to the fore. Um, we've got to decide in Scotland, and, and we should have the right to decide whether we want a future where we take the decisions about the kind of country we are and the direction we go in, or whether we're prepared to sit back and allow the likes of Boris Johnson to make those decisions for us. Uh, and I believe, this won't surprise you to hear, but I think more and more people believe that we should be taking those decisions ourselves and deciding our future for ourselves in Scotland uh, and telling people like Boris Johnson uh, that we want to do that rather than have people like him in charge. And that, I think, is what we've got to confront as a country. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman here has been quick off the mark, got his hand up. And then the lady in the blue top there with the glasses. Uh, Peter Macon, I don't work in Stirling University. Um, <laughs> just uh, to follow on for the first minister was saying there, um, I don't think it would be a big surprise to anyone that we'll not get a Section 30 order granted to us. I don't necessarily expect you to tell me now, but do we have, are we looking at other alternatives, you know, self-declarations of some description, ways of getting to to a decision or ways of getting to consult the, the population um, which are independent of, of, of permission but from the UK um, and hopefully we've got some people lined up in the international community who will who will accept whatever we do as being valid which I think will be quite important too. Okay, thank you. The lady there. Um, my name's Inga Bullen. Um, it's a planning re related... Okay, sorry, if, you, if you could just take the microphone closer. It's a planning related question. My name is Inga Bullen. As objectors to the Park of Keir planning application, we have detailed local knowledge of the issues it has raised. Other local groups have focused on other applications, such as the proposed housing development on Air 3 Curse. Local people have expertise in issues such as the environmental effects, the potential sustainability, the impact on local infrastructure, and the effect on the quality of life on the existing community. The recent Planning Act has failed to give any more weight to local communities in planning. Does the Scottish Government think it is right that planning matters are decided by the interests of commercial property developers? Okay, thank you. Anyone else there? Can I, the gentleman with the lanyard at the uh, back there, thank you. Uh, Adam MacDonald, I'm actually a member of the Scottish Youth Parliament for uh, Cunningham South, where the First Minister's hometown is. So uh, my question is to do with education. Uh, as a MSYP, it was brought to me that the UCAS fees are quite unaffordable for some young people. And I wanted to know what the Scottish Government would do about the UCAS fees that young people would have to pay to go to university. Okay, thank you. First Minister. Peter, on the point about Section 30 order and uh, legal, the legal basis for a referendum. Um, I'm not going to get into all the whys and wherefores of that because you wouldn't expect, I think you said you wouldn't expect me to do that right now. I'd, I've said two things though. One is we've got to recognise, however hard this might be for those of us, and I'm assuming you're one of those who support independence, uh, and however frustrating this may be, if Scotland's to become independent, it has to become independent by a process that allows a clear majority in favour of that to be expressed and a process that others will recognise as legitimate. And I don't just mean a UK government, although that's not unimportant, 
but I mean the international community. And that's why the referendum that we had in 2014 and the legal basis for that, that was the gold standard. And we shouldn't um, allow ourselves to you know, be diverted from wanting to uh, make our country independent by a process that is seen to be the international gold standard. And the other point I would make is related to that. I get asked this question a lot, as you would expect. Frankly, um, while of course people are, get every right to ask me whatever questions they want, it should be those in the UK government and UK political parties who are saying that they would block the right of the people of Scotland to choose their own future, who should be getting dogged with the question, why on earth do they think that is democratically acceptable? It's entirely acceptable to oppose independence. Of course it is legitimate for anybody to argue that it's not the right path for Scotland. It's not acceptable, in my view, to say that the Scottish people shouldn't have the right to choose. So I kind of feel just now the more we get, we as in the supporters of independence, get diverted onto, ah, what, if, what will we do if they block us? We kind of legitimise their right to block us. And we shouldn't be doing that right now. We should be saying to folk it's not acceptable for any Westminster government to say that the Scottish people shouldn't have the right to choose. And of course we see uh, in polling evidence this week that more and more people don't just want independence, they want to have that right to choose in the kind of timescale we've been spoken about. So we'll continue uh, to do what, what we think is necessary to give people in Scotland that right. Now I'm going to ask Aileen uh, to uh, answer Inga's question on planning. I should say generally, not so much specifically to Parker Keir. Generally, planning is one of the areas where you might find ministers being a bit cagey in how much we can say because we have to be very careful on planning issues that we don't compromise or uh, prejudice uh, decisions that are set out in a very uh, clear process. But I'll ask Aileen to uh, address that question and then I'll hand over to John uh, to take on Aaron's question on education. Yeah, thank you. And, and there still are some kind of live elements to some of these things. So I might not stop talking to the specifics around Parker here, but certainly address the point you raised through your concerns about the, the planning bill that was recently passed just at the tail end of the, of the last session. I, but I would say that I, we agree we want local communities to be involved in planning decisions. And that's actually what the planning bill has done. It has a real strong commitment to ensuring that there is local engagement within planning and to make sure that local people can have and express the, the, their own plans, their own ambitions, their own visions for the communities in which they live in. But what we want to do with the bill is to make sure that that happens far more early uh, in the process so that, that can be a, a much more positive discussion that communities can input into what their local place should look and feel like, as opposed to what happens, often happens at the, this, uh, without the reforms, that these are much more, there's much more conflict at the end of the process. We want to try and avoid that and have that in engagement far earlier in the process to make sure that there's that openness that people can contribute to what their local community looks uh, and feels like. And that is why the, the bill uh, did pass and that's what we've committed to do. And that's why when we take forward the actions to implement the act, that will be taking further uh, secondary legislation through the parliament to make sure that that comes into life so that people feel that they have ownership over the plans and the, the vision and the, what their area will look like uh, in the future. And that's what this planning bill does. It has reformed the way planning works to enable people to have a greater say. And that's you know, um, involved uh, great work with Planning Aid Scotland and others who have a real uh, focus on community to make sure that the voice is heard throughout. Now, unfortunately, planning is always going to be one of these things where sometimes people are not always going to agree. But I think if we get the process open, we those, have those discussions earlier on, that that helps ease some of that a bit and enables people to also see that there is opportunity for, to, for development and to see that in a positive sense and a positive light. Okay, and lastly in this section, John. Um, and w w we, we come at all questions around um, access to universities from the perspective that we want to reduce barriers and obstacles to, for young people to progress into um, higher education. And we've um, taken steps obviously as a government over a number of years to uh, restore the principle of um, free access to higher education. It's a policy commitment of which the government is very proud and steadfast in its commitment. Um, so obviously, and, and, and there are a whole range of other measures that we've taken to try to enhance access to higher education. The First Minister um, was uh, with University Scotland and uh, a large number of um, care experienced young people to welcome just a couple of weeks ago a commitment by 
the universities of Scotland that any care experienced young person that met the minimum access thresholds for universities would be guaranteed a place. And I think that's a really commendable commitment by our universities, which follows some of the work and the recommendations of our Commission on Widening Access. So we come at all of these questions from the perspective of wanting to remove barriers and obstacles for young people accessing um, higher education. I'll look carefully at the suggestion that you have made um, and ensure that we, uh, we, we consider whether there's more we can do in that respect to try to um, assist in removing obstacles because we want young people to be able to go to university based on their um, uh, the, the achievements they've made, uh, the contributions they can go on to make and based on their educational ability and that should be the only factor that we should be judging about their ability to progress um, in their learning. But I'll look carefully at the issue that you've raised. Thank you, First Minister. I'm going to focus in the middle of the room just now if that's okay. There's a lady in a pink top, the two in there next to a gentleman with his arm up as well. Hi, Lynn Fraser from Bannockburn. A question about the hospital, the kids' hospital in Edinburgh. I know that the current Scottish Government has spent a lot of money on undoing the disastrous PFI contracts that the previous administration saddled us with. And I was just wondering how the hospital in Edinburgh, the kids' hospital, has got caught up in that. And a quick other question, how quickly will the referendum bill get through? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lady with a pink scarf behind there as well. Um, I'm Hannah Davidson and I'm from the Stirling Champs Board. Um, as care leavers, we are one of the most likely young people to be lost in the system and forgotten about, which from experience has left so many struggle, it has left so many people to struggle with their mental health. What are the Scottish Government planning to do to prevent these young people from being vulnerable and having to wait long periods of time before getting a service? And along the other side, there's a lady uh, with Dark here with her arm up there. Thank you. Hello, my name's Pamela Morrison. This is a question on the environment, but maybe of a little bit of education as well. There is a mountain of research, global peer-reviewed research, on the benefits of veganism on the environment. Can you tell me if the Scottish Government is actually sitting up and taking notice of this? I say this as a vegan mother of two adult vegan children. Um, as I said, there's a mountain of evidence, especially when animal agriculture has been blamed as the biggest con contributor to greenhouse gases. Can you tell me if you're looking into this at all? Okay, thank you. Who's going to answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> I'll go on Okay. Uh, right, Lynn, I'm going to ask, um, well, before I ask Jean to uh, address your question about the Sick Kids Hospital, like, just on the question about the referendum bill, it is currently scheduled to be on the statute book by the end of this calendar year. It's been introduced to Parliament. It will go through the process after the summer recess, but we're considering over the summer in light of everything that's happen happening, whether we want to accelerate that process and we'll uh, make that decision before we go back uh, after the summer recess. But the current timetable is the end of this year. Um, so Jean, can you take Lynn's question? Uh, Hannah's question, I was delighted to meet with the uh, Champions Board uh, this afternoon, which was a, a fantastic meeting. I'll uh, ask John maybe to say a bit about care experience, yep, uh, what we're doing mm -hmm. around the care review. Um, and Pamela, I think, Rosanna, you were going to Take I'll, I'll take up. Rosanna will answer Pamela's question. I might with in. Maybe Mary coming yeah. in as well. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, Jean. Okay, uh, thank you. Lynn, thanks very much for the question. I mean, the first thing I need to say is that uh, the old way of funding the PFI that you referred to uh, continues to cost our health service in Scotland uh, a significant amount of money simply paying off uh, on the interest payments for something uh, that at the end of the day... Uh, our health service won't actually be able to own either, which is why uh, I think under uh, uh, the DFM, uh, when he was the finance secretary, the new model was introduced, uh, the non-profit distributing model. Uh, and that is the model that uh, the new Sick Kids Hospital in Edinburgh is uh, financed through. But the problem that we have with the Sick Kids Hospital in Edinburgh right at the minute, and the reason why I halted the move to that 
uh, hospital was nothing to do with the finance model. It was about the emerging problem with the ventilation system in the critical care unit, um, which doesn't meet the required national standards. And because that emerged so late in the day, uh, I wanted to also be assured that everything else about that new site also met those national standards. Because if there is one thing that has to be my absolute priority in everything I do, it is patient safety. And so I need to be sure that that new site in all its aspects is safe for patients and indeed for staff. So the work that I've commissioned, which uh, asks Health Protection Scotland and Health Facilities Scotland to provide me with assurance on all the other areas, on uh, other aspects of ventilation, on drainage, on water and so on, uh, is underway. I've also commissioned work from KPMG to look at all the decision making through the lifetime of this project to try and identify why it was so late in the day that the problem with critical care emerged uh, because the standards that it should be meeting were standards set in 2014, so they're not new. Uh, and at the same time, work underway now to identify what do we need to do to improve the ventilation in that critical care uh, unit. Now, I expect, and we're on track to do this, it's what I said at the outset, that by the end of this month into the early days of September, I'll have the answers to those two reviews, one on all the decision making, the one uh, the other one on the uh, rest of the site. And if I get the assurance, if I get the assurance that other areas in that site are meeting those standards and are safe, then we'll be able to trigger a phased migration of services that uh, are not impacted by critical care. So the DCN unit at the Western General, uh, the uh, outpatient services, mental health services uh, would be the ones that would be in that early migration, but until I know that that site is safe, I can't do that. Uh, once I know what needs to be done in ventilation on critical care, then we'll set a time frame for the rest of the transfer to take place. And meantime, we are making sure that the existing Sheen site is maintained properly so that it can continue to deliver the services that kids and families in Edinburgh and the surrounding area need. And I've said clearly, uh, all along that once I have the information, you will have the information too. Okay, thanks, uh, Jean. John, do you want to say a bit about the work we're doing uh, around yep. care experience young people? Yeah, about uh, three years ago now, the First Minister and I listened very carefully to the views of care experienced young people and they essentially, I think, said two things to us. Firstly, that there was a lot of good work going on within the care system to support young people but secondly they didn't feel it was nearly effective enough and did not give them the support uh, and the assistance that they required to overcome some of the challenges that they faced and to make their way through uh, our society and we accepted that uh, that that view from care experience young people and over the course of the last three years have established an independent care review and the First Minister personally gave a commitment to listen to a thousand voices of care experienced young people, um, which she does on an ongoing basis and indeed I think earlier on today uh, had some of those conversations uh, with care experienced young people as part of that commitment. And what we are keen to do is to make sure that we take um, all of the necessary steps we need to take to make sure that uh, care experienced young people are provided with the type of very focused, sustained, consistent support that will enable them to make their way through uh, our society. And fundamentally, that approach has got to relate in many ways to a point that to Jean Freeman made earlier on, that our services have got to become much more focused on an individual rather than focused on the delivery of a service and actually finding out what an individual needs, what support they require, and, as, and ensuring they can have that support on a consistent basis lies at the heart of our aspirations around the care review. And we're looking forward to receiving the recommendations of that, um, which we'll probably get in about uh, six months' time. And the government has given a commitment to act very swiftly in that respect. One of the specific points you raised, Hannah, was about um, mental health and wellbeing. And we... Uh, are taking forward a range of different measures 
through the uh, different investments that have been made in uh, counselling support within our colleges and universities. Uh, there will be commitments rolled out in partnership with our local authority colleagues for counselling services within our schools uh, to support with, uh, in, in the delivery of effective mental health and wellbeing services for young people. Um, what we are trying to do is to take forward a principle that we act and we intervene as early as we possibly can do to avoid interventions being made at a point of crisis because we will not be able, no public service can intervene in moments of, if we just allow things to become, to reach moments of crisis, we will never properly deliver an effective service that meets the needs of individuals. So we need to work on a much earlier intervention basis. And that's the focus of the work that we're taking forward um, on mental health and wellbeing for young people. Thanks, I, I'm conscious of time, but I just want to add a, a personal note to this because this is one of the most important pieces of work that the Scottish Government is doing right now. You know, when a young person grows up in the, the care of the state, uh, for whatever reason, uh, through no fault of their own, then the state has a very, very precious uh, responsibility to make sure that young person gets properly cared for, protected, but also has the same opportunities in life as any other young person. And, you know, I've met so many uh, young people now as part of the Thousand Voices uh, programme, and I've, I've met so many fantastic young people that are doing great things. I met uh, some of you this afternoon, uh, but I've also heard stories about the barriers and the obstacles and often the trauma that is compounded uh, through experiences in the care system. And we've got an obligation to, to do something about that. And hearing the voices of young people with experience of the care system is a vital part of that. This week alone, I've I visited a children's home in Ayrshire. I, I spent time with care experience uh, young people yesterday getting their exam results and, and met the Champions Board this afternoon. So this is a big commitment and it's one, certainly one that's got well under my skin. Uh, you know, there's very few more important things that any government will do uh, than to make sure that they're given opportunities uh, to all young people and not allowing uh, young people who through no fault of their own end up in the care system to get left behind. So it's one that collectively uh, we're extremely committed to. So thank you very much for, for your question. Uh, and I'm now going to hand over to the tag team of Rosanna and Mary uh, to deal with uh, the question that Pamela raised. Right. Um, thanks, Pamela. Uh, and I'm aware that there are uh, th there's a vigorous debate out there um, about uh, about diet in general sense. Um, where I would have to take this from, though, is that all of our scientific advice does tell us, and that includes the climate change scientists who are our advisors, that. In general terms, we need to be eating a lot more fruit and veg, and we need to be eating less meat, particularly less red meat. But that's not advice that is confined to what is good for the planet. That's also advice about what is good for us as individuals as well. And I think we all know that. Um, so I would say, um, and I'm sure my health colleague, although she's not joining the tag team, um, would want to endorse that as well, that within those general parameters, as a government, we would be, be saying to people, choose your own diet, choose how you want to construct your own diet in the best way for you, keeping in mind that at the end of the day, we all need to eat a heck of a lot more fruit and veg than we do in Scotland, um, and we need to perhaps cut back on the red meat. Now, I think that the question is probably connected to the issue of the raising of livestock uh, and the contribution that uh, meat production, if you like, uh, uh, um, does to climate change emissions. So uh, Mary will come in on that, but I do want to say something here about being careful about uh, taking from the global and assuming that that <coughs> automatically means what happens locally as well. The fact is that livestock production in Scotland isn't done in the kind of labour intensive, uh, emissions intensive way that it is done in, in lots of countries in the world. Um, virtually all of our meat is produced on hills that will not be producing any other food because that's just not the way uh, our, our land works. Um, if you take livestock off the hills, you aren't suddenly going to have avocado farms or vineyards. We know that there will be no <coughs> food produced there at all. So livestock production in Scotland is a fundamental part of our food production. And there's a great deal of work, a huge amount of work 
right now taking place in Scotland, researching how we can ensure that the emissions, in this case often not carbon emissions, but methane emissions that emanate from that um, are reduced considerably. And that's why the Committee for Climate Change, even the uh, uh, WWF report all said that livestock production can continue to be uh, a part of the Scottish rural economy um, within that broader context of eating a bit less meat and eating a lot more fruit and veg. But I think Mario will probably want to say a bit more about the, the kinds of issues that I've touched on there in terms of the emissions side of things. Absolutely. I mean, just to follow on from what Rosanna was saying there, I mean, I know that we, I think it was in the advice that we had from the UK Committee on Climate Change about um, switching to a plant-based diet. But again, if you look at the, the type of land that we have in Scotland, about 80% of it is classified as, I mean, I hate using this term, but it would be termed unproductive. So it's not as if we can completely change the farming systems that we have here as well. And I think it comes back to, again, what Rosanna said about uh, what we need to do to improve our diet as a whole. And I think part of that, it's about that, I mean, I completely respect the choice if people choose to, to become a vegan, but I think that it's about, I think Quality Meat Scotland have a campaign now about meat with integrity, and it's about eating that higher quality and uh, sustainable meat and that sustainable way of farming. Because as well as the, the climate emergency that was declared earlier this year, we also had the report about biodiversity and the massive threats that we face there, where I think it was a million species are at threat of becoming extinct. And livestock farming has an integral part to play there because if we're farming in that high quality and sustainable way that has added on benefits for biodiversity and can really can very much enhance that as well which has the knock-on benefits for climate change and uh, we'll have to look at some of the sites as well where we have livestock grazing that's often protecting historic carbon stores that if we were to apply that would release that carbon into the atmosphere so and we also have all sorts of different models of farming as well there's the ethical dairy in Rainton where the that's a project that, that we've supported where the calves are kept uh, with the cows. Uh, again, it's about that su the sustainable practices that we have there as well, as well as the whole host of projects that Rosanna mentioned as well, where we're looking at either methane capture, the different types of feed that we can adapt for our livestock. But I would say that the type of farming that we have here in Scotland, again, is completely different to other systems that we have elsewhere. And I think it is an important part of us helping to tackle climate change and the challenges that we face in biodiversity as we move forward. Okay. Good. Uh, okay, thank you. Our great time has overtaken us, so we're the last three questions. And if I could put a plea, short, sharp questions, short, sharp answers, we could. Lady in the yellow top there, and the lady down the front after her. Hi, it's Alison Graham. Um, I'm really passionate about the idea of citizens' assemblies, having looked into this, and I was delighted um, to hear that we're going to have one. Um, nationally in Scotland. Now, given this is the 50th um, time that the Cabinet have travelled since 2008, the one thing at the session in Edinburgh University, I was a little bit disappointed, was here it was likely to be based in Edinburgh and Glasgow. Now, to really engage um, the population or society across the board, as well as having a cross um, population in the Citizens' Assembly, but to actually have people engage and be able to come to along to see and to watch and to really get enthused and engaged in our democracy in something that I think is a really exciting development. I'm just wondering whether places like Stirling and, you know, the borders and, you know, the northeast and, you know, the islands would also be able to partake in something like this, which I think is a really exciting opportunity. And the lady around the front here. Hi, my name is Karen Flynn and I'm from Early Learning and Child Care. What I would like to ask is, well, we're in the midst of a huge expansion policy, which is a fantastic policy, all going well, will make a huge difference for Scotland as a whole. Um, early intervention actually will link on to hopefully less people in prison in the future, less people taking drugs. So if we could get it right, we all want to work together together to get it right. So my question is, at the moment, we're in the midst, we're exactly one year away from the full rollout. I work in the private provider sector and we have all our staff are migrating to the local authority sector. So we're in a workforce crisis. So basically the here and now, personally in our company, we've, we're now up to 46 staff lost. We cannot replace them. 
with 16 and 17 year olds. So the question being, what can Scottish Government do here and now to support the sector, to ensure that our quality doesn't dip any lower than it's already dipping, and that we, meet, we get to August 2020 and meet the national standard? Okay, thank you. And one final question. Um, there's a lady there with her hand up at the very end of the second row at the back there. Hi, so my name's Nicola. Um, so you mentioned that we've got huge renewable energy, energy potential, which comes with it many, many job opportunities. However, while campaigning for independence, there was much talk of our extensive oil and gas reserves. If this is indeed a climate emergency, which you yourself have stated, as have many scientists for so many years, then it's imperative we, that we keep our oil and gas in the ground. Do you not agree? And are you able to convince me that we are not just continuing like with business as usual? Okay, um, I'm going to ask John to deal with uh, Karen's question on early years and then I will, uh, in Mike Russell's absence, cover Alison's and then I'll, uh, given that it's another Nicola, I'll have a go at answering Nicola's question. <laughs> Karen, um, the way you characterise the expansion of early and childcare to 1140 hours for um, eligible two-year-olds and three- and four-year-olds is exactly the way that I would character, characterise it. I think this is one of the boldest, most significant policy interventions we could make and the way you set out how that early start in life, if we can support that better for, uh, young, for children, we will um, ass assist our efforts to try to minimise damage later on in, uh, in, the, in their lives and, and poor outcomes. Now, we're obviously um, taking forward this expansion in partnership with our local authority colleagues. We agreed with our local authority colleagues a resource and capital financial arrangement for that over the period of time. That's it's not in dispute. We've agreed that we don't often or always agree about money with local authorities. Uh, I speak with the scars. I've been a finance secretary for many years on that <laughs> question, but we've managed to agree this one. Um, so there's no dispute about money here. Um, the question is about rollout. And what we've encouraged is good partnership working with the private sector. Because if I was rolling out this policy, if I was responsible in a local authority, if, let's say, the private sector is dealing with 20% of provision just now, I'd want to make very sure that it could make 20% of the commitment to 1140 hours. Because you want to be able to, if you want to deliver the, I want to deliver the policy successfully in August 2020. So if I've got some folk who are already delivering it and contributing to that, why on earth would it be in my interest not to have them part of the solution? So that's what we've been encouraging local authorities to do. I'm very happy to speak to you in detail about your own personal circumstances afterwards, because I'm deeply concerned to hear about your staff turnover point, because that um, I understand. The, the, the possible difficulty of that in the short term, because obviously local authorities may be able to offer um, uh, higher salaries than you can offer in the interim, but in the financial arrangements that we've put in place with local authorities, I think that can be mitigated if you're trying to keep people in the market and, not, and make sure that the private sector can be part of the solution. So I'm very happy to talk to you personally afterwards and I'd appreciate the detail that you can share with me about your experience because I want to make it absolutely clear we see the private sector as being integral to the delivery of this policy around the country because a lot of very good work is done by the private sector uh, in the current provision. Okay, thanks John. And uh, briefly, uh, Alison, Mike Russell, who is overseeing the uh, establishment of the Citizens' Assembly for the Government is not able to be here. Um, I'll, I'll feed back that point that you, you may have seen we've now appointed the co-conveners of the Citizens' Assembly. Um, and the important point to stress here is although the government has made the decision to establish it, its operations will be independent of government. And I think it's important that we keep uh, that, that separation. Um, the members of the Citizens' Assembly will obviously be drawn from around the country. Um, I take your point about the, the location of where it will meet, and I will feed that point back. But the I guess the point I'm stressing here is that 
in its operations, it has to have a degree of independence uh, from, from government if its findings and recommendations are going to have the credibility um, and buy-in that we hope uh, they will have. But I'll certainly feed the point back. Um, Nicola, I mean, I, thank you for raising this question. I mean, I, I, I get the, uh, the, the, the place you're coming from in that, and I think uh, many people would have a lot of sympathy from, for what you've said. We are in a transition uh, right now to becoming not just a, a low carbon economy, uh, but as we've heard, not, not just a carbon zero economy, but a, an economy that is at zero of all uh, emissions. But the, the pace and journey of that transition has to take account of a number of different factors. Um, if we were to you know, immediately cease uh, oil and gas production in Scotland, we would make ourselves dependent uh, very quickly on imported energy. And the, the, the impact, the global emissions impact of that would probably be greater uh, than what we're doing in terms of, of North Sea production, which is a highly regulated sector. So the challenge there as we make the, the, the transition is to make sure that the oil and gas sector is itself working to reduce its emissions and to uh, minimise its impact on the environment. But also crucially, and this is where Scotland is doubly uh, fortunate. We've had uh, the oil and gas uh, impact, although we, because of how we're governed, we haven't had all the financial uh, benefits of that down the years, unlike a country like Norway, for example. But we've also got the massive renewable energy uh, potential as well. So the skills that have been built up in the North Sea, increasingly, we need to use that expertise to properly utilise the renewable energy potential. So we want to, we want to accelerate this transition we're in but obviously, as we do that, we need to take account of a number of factors to make sure that we are genuinely reducing our emissions in the way that we want to. Um, before I hand back to Graham, can I just thank you all? Uh, we never get through as many questions as we want to in this session, but uh, these have all been excellent questions, local, national and uh, global. So uh, thank you very much. You've given us a lot of food for thought. I hope we've been able to uh, give you uh, answers. Uh, Derek even managed to improve on his previous answers. So, uh, but if, if there's any issues that you feel we haven't covered properly or issues you haven't had the chance to ask, please take advantage of the ways that you can follow up with us. But in the meantime, thank you very much for being a fantastic audience. Thank you.